in three, two. Hello and welcome to Eternal Dirtles. I'm your host, Zach Clark. And with me as always, Phil Blackman. Phil, how's it going, man? Dude, it's good to be back. So uh, yeah, man. thank you for covering. Thank you for covering last week. Uh, I recently had nose surgery, which is why I was uh, out in a while. I had my deviated septum corrected. So I was uh, in recovery for a while. My face was swollen and looked did terrible. I noticed and now no I feel change. like I feel like it is reasonable of enough. Like I still have some swelling, but otherwise, like um, I'm back to more or less normal and feeling good and happy to be back to be talking about some nerd cards. Yeah, there's man. some uh, there's some hitters in this set. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to be a Titanic uh, overhaul or anything. I don't think there's any major players, but there's definitely some hits for Legacy. So I'm yeah, definitely. I'm 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 super excited for this set because because of flavor reasons for sure. Um, oh, of course. But there's some obviously there's some great cards. I was actually just over at my uh, buddy's house who lives a couple houses down from me who used to play with me uh, during like the Urza Saga days. So I was explaining. Mm -hmm. I was playing Magic. I was playing pre-modern with his kid. Cause this kid is like learning how to play. So I was like, Oh, I'll just like show you some pre-modern decks, like Sly versus uh, hatred, uh, that sort of thing. But anyhow, uh, so I was telling him like, Oh yeah, this is like, you basically like get to see like new design with all those old, like all the old flavor. Um, but uh, uh, one of the things that's great about this is that, uh, you know, we've got access to all these cards and we can design our decks on moxfield.com. Oh yeah, what is what is Mox, Moxfield.com? I've heard of Moxfield.com. Uh, I I love I love uh, there's a there's a uh, YouTube uh, couple of uh, YouTube guys that do uh, Commander. They're called Nitpicking Nerds, and mm -hmm. uh, they're they're the best because they're like Moxfield.com is the best uh, is the best deck building website. It's so better than Redacted website. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, man. Like, have have you ever used Redacted website, uh, Phil? Uh, I can't say that I've I, I've heard of Redacted website, but I can't say that I've used yeah. it because I had to. Uh, I had we had no choice before Moxfield.com. I, I just didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I was just sitting here with decklists in my brain and nowhere yeah. to put them. Yeah, I mean, sometimes people were just throwing decklists on Twitter. You know? Oh wow! Jeez, it's why dangerous. would you do that? Do, Yo, you Twitter's know Twitter's up in the air these days. You know, you can't yeah. be doing that well, anymore. Hey, speaking of which, you know what's wild is uh, Moxfield. The guys at Moxfield, because uh, mm. I have the I have the low low uh, right. with those guys. I grew up with those cats. Um, they're working on a Magic the Gathering social media website that may uh, that may uh, be something worth using uh, when inevitably Twitter becomes it, a train wreck. I mean, it Twitter, may it already be worth forty four billion dollars. <laughs> that would be great, right? That'd be great. That'd be great for yeah. those guys if they just you know develop something that's worth forty four mil. Or yeah, I would. I would love that. I feel like we should get a cut because we because we were in we were in the ground floor, right? Uh, no, but uh, I, I say all that to say this: Moxfield's a great website. You should already be using it uh to build decks to uh to, you know just the, it, it's just it's beautiful looking it works on your mac it works on your pc and it works on uh your phone you don't even need an app they might even be making an app soon who knows it's just crazy um anyhow I, we should I, go I, I honestly think that if like the i get that like they you don't need an app for moxfield which in to some degree is a draw to the site and I also think that if they developed an app, it would also be a home run. I feel like well, they that's can't the really thing is like they they could do that too. You know, they could have an app like that 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 combines all the features of like a social media website even. But get at the ground floor now while while you can. You know, secure your secure your uh, your screen name and stuff. Uh, also, just get some decks on there. Uh, you can check us out at uh, moxfield.com slash eternal dirtles. Uh, I'm also on there at moxfield.com slash dirtle magus. Um, so yeah, moxville.com. You should be checking it out anyhow. I'm on there Let's... as obviously as slash force of Phil. Force and of I've been updating, I've been like routinely updating my current miracles list with Triumph of St. Catherine, uh, because Triumph is the, the list truth. Is hot. And I'm like, the list is hot. It, it's yeah, like, man, and people are loving that I, list. I, enough people have like gotten onto Moxfield to follow that list that I'm, I'm actively trying to update it as I make changes to it. You know what? Like, in, in 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 like live i try and update it as as soon as i'm like i'm doing this that way everybody's like you know the, speed with the, where the advertising section of this of this is done but i do want to mention something to you phil about moxville.com did you know that you can write primers uh for your deck on on the site like there's a primer yeah. section under each deck that you could actually write like your thought process and stuff i didn't know about the primer section but thank you for uh, yeah. telling me and all of our listeners that they can also write about their deck list on there yeah, I don't generally do it for uh, legacy decks. I do I do like to do it for the commander decks because there's a lot going on with the commander decks yeah. I build. Yeah. I like to Rube Goldberg my commander decks. So mm -hmm. I, I've been I've been working on primers and stuff for that. Anyhow, I say all that to say this. 
Brothers War, let's talk about it. We've got the top 10 cards from Brothers War, uh, plus uh, four uh, honorable mentions. Uh, they're the top 10 in no particular order. Let's start with the honorable mentions. Uh, Stonebrain. Yeah, Stonebrain. Uh, do you want to read the cards or shall I? Uh, if you have Stonebrain up real fast, I could probably yeah, find I got, it. Yeah, I, like I got Stonebrain. I got you. Please do. The Stonebrain, Stonebrain is a legendary artifact for two mana. It says two tap, exile the Stonebrain. Choose a card name. Search target opponent's hand graveyard uh, library for up to four cards with that name and exile them. They shuffle. Then they draw a card for each card exiled from their hand this way. Activate only as a sorcery. So okay. this is a pretty solid hate sideboard hate card. It says exile four of a card, not just non-land card. You can name mm -hmm. pretty much any, this is just a lobotomy. This Ooh, is like a basic very cheap, force. cheap lobotomy. <laughs> you can you and and it's interesting because it made me think colorless lobotomy but, too. Like you're paying the same a, amount for lobotomy, it, but like it's not it's a colorless lobotomy. Yeah. I'm I I am excited to try this card, but my instinct tells me that two mana to Two mana up front plus two mana to activate only at sorcery speed, which means let's say like the play pattern is if you're if you're playing against combo, I think this is just naturally going to be too slow, right? Yeah. If you spend two mana, tap out, go, they don't kill you. You untap, you pay two more mana again, and they still haven't killed you or have some way to disrupt what's going on. It, it just feels like four mana at sorcery speed up front against any combo deck and legacy, and you're just going to get trounced, particularly if it's not a combo deck that's reliant on exactly one thing. Yeah, that's um, the problem with like if you're playing against Storm and you name uh, Tendrils of Agony and then just like empty the warrens. Burning Wish. You know? yeah. yeah, or empty the warrens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. So it, it's like against Doomsday, <clears> like <throat> my experience against Doomsday is like that deck is very consistently good at playing Disruption on one and killing you on turn two if they feel like it, yeah. right? Like you can potentially stone brain their Thassa's Oracle, but if that even remotely picked up at all, they would just have all of the technology that they would want to be able to stop it. So... I, I am going to try this card because it's, you know, lobotomies are always interesting in surgical, even though, I mean, the benefit of surgical is that it's zero mana, but surgical requires that they already have to have one in their graveyard. Like they have to have, you have to yes. interact it in some way. Exactly. Stonebrain doesn't need any of that. But I, I feel like where Stonebrain's ultimately going to end up is just in ancient tomb decks. And the ancient tomb decks that want to have better game against combo, this is where that card is actually going to shine in my, in my view, because yeah. being able to go <laughs> ancient tomb, like if you go on the play ancient tomb, Stonebrain, go. And now you don't have to have any other resources set up. You can just, you can untap and activate the stone brain off of your ancient tomb and lobotomy them. And yeah. I think that's the only world where like stone brain will actually be fast enough to do what you want it to do. So do I think it's going to land in legacy? Absolutely. But I think it's going to be res restricted or relegated to the sideboards of ancient tomb decks. And, uh, you know, I was just thinking it's, it is exile stone brain. So you couldn't like, I, I'm always liking to think in uh, terms of uh, eight cast using Emery to get it back, but you can't because it says Exile you Stonebrain. You, you can Karn to get it back because Karn can pull from Exile, so you okay. can Stonebrain them again that way. But the odds are, if you've Stonebrain, if you're bringing in Stonebrain and you Stonebrain them, that'll probably give you enough time to bridge the gap to Karn, but you're also probably winning at that point anyway. Yeah, you just, like, you the, just the, crunch in. Exactly. The odds <laughs> that you would need to go, to, that you would need to Karn and then activate to pull the stone brain again, to spend four more mana to lobotomy them again. Yeah, it's that's like, a lot. That, that, that's that, a lot. That's that eight mana like, to like, to like, you, I think yeah. there's better ways to spend eight mana in this format. At that point, you're probably already winning. But if yeah. you were to go Ancient Tomb, Stone Brain, go, you get to untap, you get to Stone Brain them, play another land. And then on turn three, you get to do whatever you want, knowing that like, I mean, you have time to develop because you've stalled them enough. Phil, like, you could, you could Ancient Tomb, Stone Brain, untap, play Seed of Synod. Uh, tap the Seed of Synod to play Emery, stone brain them, and and just keep going. You know, like you, like there's a lot there's a lot to be said about a deck that cheats on mana, like eight cast. So I, I, I see I see stone brain as being being a card you might think about playing. You know, in yeah, the board, I mean, I, obviously. I, I think like stone. I, I will not be surprised to ever see stone brain in deckless. Yeah, I will be surprised if anybody like. It, it, similar to like boarding in surgical against like control decks or against, you know, uh, Delver or anything that's not like an actual combo deck that it can disrupt, like that's meaningful disruption. Like Stone Brain will be the same trap that every lobotomy has ever been, but it will be good for the ancient tomb decks that specifically need hate against particular combo decks that just go way too fast. Yeah. It's also possible that like you could theoretically play this in the sideboard of lands deck too that also wants hit against combo. I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better than other lock pieces that you would play in that space. Yeah. But uh, the fact that you can go turn one exploration, play land, untap, and then have uh, access to mana to stone brain people, it's like, maybe. 
But my guess, Stone Brain, Ancient Tomb deck, sideboard, that's it. And okay. it'll it'll be fine. All right. Well, let's talk about Arcane Proxy. Uh, Arcane Proxy is a seven mana artifact creature wizard uh, that is a 4-3. And it says, when Arcane Proxy enters the battlefield, if you cast it, exile target instant or sorcery card with mana value equal or less than Arcane Proxy's power from your graveyard. Copy that card. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. Or you can prototype it for two blue and one carless, and it's a 2-1. That's the part I'd like to talk about. Because I don't yeah, think that's, we're the, only, that's the only part it. that's relevant. Well, yeah. not, not not totally not totally relevant because um, there's there's a couple of things with this card. So let let's say we're casting it for the uh, for the cost that is castable in Legacy, right? Three mana for a uh, two one that uh, basically Snapcaster's uh, a card of two or less. So you're saving saving one mana on a Snapcaster Mage, right? If you're casting a two mana spell, right? Yes. Yes. Right. Uh, so that's great. But uh, your opponent cannot abrupt decay this card because it does cost seven mana. No, no, no. And if you prototype it, it's three mana. It does. It is three mana. Okay, that's good. That's yeah, good. Yeah. I didn't actually know that. For, 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 for the rules, like if you prototype a card, the prototype is that color, has that CMC, and, and has that power and toughness. Yeah, it does say, it, it, it does it, say it, that actually, yeah. If, if, if you think about like the, the way to think about prototype is just think about as though they put- And we're like a split card. Yeah, it's really a moto double face card, right? Yeah. It's just not, it's all on one face instead of being two sided. Yeah. Like they could have just printed exactly like one blue blue for two one that has the same text on the other side of the card. And that's what it would be. Exactly. Right? So, like, okay. The, yeah. It's like, it, it, it's, it is going so, to be one of those things where like you will have to like be mindful that it is those same things on the table for like when it was cast, if a deck yeah. can play both, both sides of it, if you will. But yeah. Well, th you can I, think about it in terms of like exhume is a card that exists, right? Like you could exhume yes, yes. Uh, the full cost and then get, get that benefit, right? If your opponent yeah. is playing like reanimator or something. Um, not, I, not that that's going to happen a lot, but that's an interaction that does happen in Legacy. Yeah, the, 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 there's benefits to Arcane Proxy. If you look at it as just the one blue blue two one and you compare it to its obvious uh, comparison, which is Snapcaster Mage. Yeah. The downside is that obviously it doesn't have flash, right? So you're not going to be able to catch counter spells on this. That is correct. The benefit, however... There is there is upside. I don't know what deck would want it, but there is upside to it's three mana two one ETB, and you can flash you can effectively flash back something that is CMC two or less, and so, not necessarily blue, and not necessarily blue. You don't have to worry so, about its casting cost at all. So like you, you don't have to get casting a Rakdos card. You know this is a card I think that you could see in the more like Grixis style control decks that we were we were talking about before. Like they're really hard to get going. Uh, mm -hmm. because like, you know, your mana base is kind of all over the place and a wasteland ruins it for you. This is a card that like can kind of put you back into that, uh, into that mode. If you can actually get it out on, you know, get it out the cast. So that's where I think this space for the card actually does exist is it, do it the two advantages that it has over Snapcaster Mage is it can fix mana. Mm -hmm. And the two, if you flash back a two drop, you actually net a mana that Snapcaster doesn't net you, net you. Well, let's talk about like. The, the play pattern here is obviously like turn one, whatever, turn two, him you, turn three, play this, him you, right? Yeah, I mean, that, and so in, in that position, you're saying that my mana is developing on black, black, and blue, blue within the first three turns, which does mean that you're at some point you will have to expose your, you have to expose yourself to Wasteland because yeah. you can't open Island Island, or you can't open Island Swamp and cast this and, uh, uh, a, what's we call it, and uh, him. Correct, yeah. But like the, the upside of this card too is, Let's say you were in the world where expressive iteration is an insanely good card and you want to be flashing back to your expressives. The benefit of this card is you could go expressive on, on, let's say it's your third turn, you go expressive, hit your land drop and you went up a card, go. You can untap, cast this flashback, the expressive and still have your land drop where yeah. Snapcaster wouldn't allow that. Now, the, the difference though is that Arcane Proxy is only going to really exist as playable in those types of decks where you are playing at sorcery speed for like, yeah you're playing proactive proactive decks basically you're, you're, you're definitely playing, playing proactive yeah. yeah the 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 downside of that though is those proactive decks so like let's say we, is like exactly what you're talking about ei him to turok we're in grixis we're doing all this stuff right yeah if you're in one blue blue that means that you have to compete against shit like narset and maybe yeah. you play this in addition to those three drops but like those three drops are already the like right now the grixis sort of space exists because they're playing some number of 
Hidetsuku who consumes all in their 75, yep. which means that you can't play Snapcaster because you're fucking up your graveyard and you don't want those Nambos built into your deck because you could catch the opposite end of it if you don't line them up exactly right. Yep. But this could open up space where like maybe you're in a Grixis control deck where you play this and then you also have like, if you if you are hitting them with discard spells that you're also playing like maybe some number of reanimation spells. So you can have this in your graveyard as both something that you can cast on three and then you can take something out of reanimator's playbook and do something like that. So there's space for this card. I, I don't think, it, I mean, the thing is, is I don't think this card is going to like overhaul an entire archetype. I think it'll just give uh, a new avenue to certain archetypes, but I also don't think it's going to like change the paradigm of any particular archetype in a way that's meaningful to change the format in any way that anybody's going to have to like meaningfully change their sideboards for. Yeah. Now you wanted to talk about meticulous excavation. Uh, yes, I did want to talk about meticulous excavation, not uh, for anything beyond that it is just a glaringly obvious combo card, if there is ever anything to combo with it. So it's an enchantment for a white mana. It says two and a white return target permanent you control to its owner's hand. If it has unearth exile instead, then return it, that card to its owner's hand, whatever, that's flavor text. And it says only activate during your turn, but it doesn't crucially say activate only once. So you can pick up as many permanents as you want, as long as you have two and a white to spend to pick it up. So anything that's just this kind of mana sync that doesn't require that, that you can do open-ended like there's there, there is a mana gate on this but like that's the activation cost but there's no uh number of times that you're restricted to so if there was a way that you could make four mana uh that's three in a white you could generate infinite mana by picking up a permanent of some kind like this just screams combo card like this plus other thing that makes mana is just infinite mana like i don't know what those cards are it's not the type of deck that i would build but it is one of those cards where like if you have them in your collection because something eventually is printed that interacts with this that becomes a two card combo like that's not surprising will that, yeah. that kind of deck ever be good probably not but it's probably yeah. a fun fnm deck but this is the type of card that like nobody is doing anything fair with this card like if this yeah. card ever if you ever sit across on the table from this card in constructed it's not doing something fair. <laughs> it does yeah, not pass it does not pass the uh false the, cure test this the, the way i yeah the way i think about this card is probably similar to uh what's the uh, the white enchantment in hammer time in modern uh Sigarda's aid. aid yeah so like Sigarda's aid sucks until they gave you a one mana 10 10 right yeah. so it's like w once you have a one mana 10 10 in the format Sigarda's aid looks really good to go down a card because now you just have a one mana 10 10 pretty yep. fucking sweet like meticulous excavation feels similar in that space where it's like if you have something that's like oh wow now i have infinite mana like all right cool that's all i gotta say about meticulous yeah. excavation all right so we got one more card to the top 10 this is what i call the trap card of the set uh i i think this card looks super interesting but I don't think it's going to see play. That's Hostile Negotiations. This is a instant, a black instant for three and a black. And it says, exile the top three cards of your library uh, in a face down pile. And then exile the top three cards of your library in another face down pile. Look at e uh, the cards of each pile. Then turn a pile of your choice face up. And then an opponent gets to choose uh, one of those piles. So you basically, you're flipping over six cards uh, in two piles and showing your opponent one pile and like, which one do you want? The one I'm showing you or the one I'm not showing you? And then you pay three life. You So you take the one he chooses and you pay three life. So this is a, a, this is a nice nod to fact, fact of fiction. Yeah. And it's an instant I, I, too. I, I'm, I'm pretty low on this card, even though like, it, four mana is just too expensive. Straight up, four mana is just too much. It's even in black, even into even in black, it's, it's, it's too much. But also I think this card is noticeably different than like is, not only do you have to lose three life, but I think this card is noticeably worse than Factor Fiction for a couple of reasons. So the way that you actually play this card out, so like let's talk about Factor Fiction, right? We've all mm -hmm. been fofed in our in our day. Yeah. So when Fof is EOT Fof, you lose. Yeah. EOT Fof, you lose. Classic meme. Like when you flip over five cards and your opponent has to split them, you're also gaining the information of your opponent splitting the cards based on what they care about. Like them giving yeah. you them doing the split is also telling you what they're probably soft to. Yeah. Right. So you do gain information from your opponent's choice. Aside from that, this one in, in, in fact of fiction, it's five cards that will be able to be split up into any pile any way you want. So you could get it could be a pile of one card that's going to give you one card. It could be a pile of four cards if you just want yeah. resources. This is three. Usually, this is three and three every time. Usually it's a three two split, but it's three and three that you can't mix. So yeah. you pull three cards face down and then you pull another three cards face down. It's not like you pull six cards and set three in one pile and three face up. Like you don't mix six cards. You have three that's set. You have three that's set. What so I, what I really like about this though, is that it, it, it and it's the same thing with factor fiction and it's the same thing with Jace uh, architect of whatever. The, architect the, of the, thought, bro. Yeah. Architect of thought. It's been so long. Uh, 
is that it offers your opponent the opportunity to completely screw up based on information he doesn't really have. Yeah, but if your opponent, yeah, I, I agree. I agree that like that, that to me, is. that's 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 where I live in Magic the Gathering is like giving your opponent the chance to screw up because I'm not winning. I'm not winning any other way. Let's be honest. I just think that like if like even let's say you were playing a control deck that mm -hmm. would want an instant speed spell to go up cards. Like, it, OK, so we're we are past predict. We are past expressive iteration our resource card, because we want to play entirely at instant speed. We are past, you know, weird fringy shit like Archmage's Charm. And we are at hostile negotiations because it's in black. And we want to be in those colors for whatever reason. I still can't imagine that four mana at instant speed, that this is the best thing to be doing. When we also have shit like, there was also the domain card that was spoiled in the last set, the three mana, look at the top X cards of which equal to your domain and pick two of them. Like, this in a vacuum, like, in a vacuum, is this better than Factor Fiction? No, no. So I then think just Factor play Fi Factor Fiction, right? Like, I think, it, it, and that's the thing. <laughs> right? Like, you can't even play Factor Fiction, right? Like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, this card's this card's cool because it's new, but I think Factor Fiction is just a better card. Yes, because you're cho at the end of the day, you're choosing. Like, you're the player that gets to choose. So, if your opponent, if all you need to do is Force of Will, which was always what would happen, right? Like you. You'd be in a situation where you have to cast for uh, factor fiction because you needed a counter spell, and it's force of will, counter spell, a bunch of other stuff. And your opponent goes, "Well, I have to separate these. I guess I'll put force of will in one, hoping that you don't have a blue card in your hand and all the other cards in the other." Like if you already had the counter spell, you're going to take four cards, right? If you didn't, you're going to take the force of will. You had that control, whereas now you have to like kind of uh, three card monte your opponent into believing that like what you're showing him is all the information he needs to make the bad decision. Then there's a lot of mind games that go into that. Like you could definitely be like, well, I want to, I want to show him the card that I know that I need. And that I know that he knows that I need so that he chooses the other pile, but the other pile has got like two of that card in it, you know, that kind of thing. I think the only hostile negotiation about this card is how much time we spend talking about. It's it. true. It's true. All right, let's, let's go on to the top 10 uh top 10 uh cards from this set and we're gonna just start with our boy gix yogmoth praetor who is a 3-3 phyrexian praetor that is legendary for one and two black and reads whenever a creature deals combat damage to one of your opponents its controller may pay one life if they do draw a card and then it also has pay four mana and three black mana and discard x cards exile the top X cards of your target op of target opponent's library, you may play lands and spells from among those cards without paying their mana cost. I think that part is irrelevant. I think the top part and the three, three for three is pretty much more relevant. Am I wrong? Yeah, I agree that the seven mana activated cost is flavor yeah. text. This is just, this is Edric, but mm -hmm. Edric in black. Black Edric. So it's black Edric. And I, I, I don't know if any deck wants that in the format, but at the same time, like, there hasn't been an Edric in black before. And yeah. in the world where Edric is good enough to see play, this is a reasonable card. Like Edric is a, like in my mind, Edric is a powerful enough card if there was a, ever a reason to go wide and blue and green. And I don't know what that is, but in Gix, maybe there is. Here's, here's the thing. Know, that... but like you, you are in the space of like, you know, Baleful Strix and Snapcaster Mage and like whatever bodies that if they if they hit and then they're all Ophidians. Like in Mono Black, turning all any creature you have into an Ophidian feels powerful. Yeah, uh, I mean a three three for three is probably you know, in a world where Dark Ritual is the only playable black card, like maybe not. But what, where do we when do we get to a point when uh, playing a one drop, playing a three drop off of a Dark Ritual is is like legacy playable again? This isn't it. Right, like if this was a this three, definitely four, isn't it. No, if this was the, a three the, four, it might be it because it could you wouldn't have to die to bolt. The, but we, like, we're, we're, we're almost there. We're almost to the point where we're playing, you know, dark Rit hippie again in legacy, and that's kind of exciting. I think we're nowhere near dark Rit hippie. I think uh, if <laughs> well, you, I mean if, obviously if, not dark Rit hippie, no, no, but no, like no, I'm no, saying I mean, that that level of impact, you know. I, I think that level of impact is reserved for Doomsday. I think your 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 three drop on turn one that sure. actually is good enough is Dark Written to Doomsday. I don't think there's. I, said, I don't think that this, there's. We don't play. We don't play Dark Writ in in our black, you know, tempo style decks, which there aren't a lot of, because you're down a card. But this brings you back up a card in a turn. 
Yeah, I just I, that's the thing. I don't think around. that kind of deck exists. I think like if yeah. you are playing this, you are doing it like in my mind, the the Gix Praetor deck would never play Dark Ritual. Yeah, because the whole point is that you want to have your board established already by the time this comes down. So you use your first couple of turns for some kind of disruption plus being able to get a creature on the table, which makes me think that you would want some kind of disruptive creatures to hit the table. And then you play Gix and then you recoup those cards. Yeah. And then like, you're already like attacking in because it, it, it has haste in that, in that way, right? Like your, your creature yeah. that's attacking is going to draw you the card when this comes into play. That's yeah. There's, I don't yeah. think there's any world where like you're playing dark ritual in your Gix deck because gar dark ritual isn't a creature that could attack and draw you a card. So I yeah. don't know what that world is. I would be surprised. I, I mean, I honestly, if if Gix does hit the table at any point in Legacy in a way that's relevant and not just cute at FNM, I would be surprised. But like at the same time, it's a really powerful effect, and Black has never had it, so maybe yeah. it's good enough. All right, uh, let's let's go to uh, this is three cards technically. Uh, Titania, Voice of Gaia. Then we'd want to talk uh, also about uh, Argoth, right? The because that uh, melds with it. Argoth, Sanctum of Nature. And then they meld into, uh, what is it, uh, Titania, Gaia Incarnate. So first, let's talk about uh, Titania, Voice of Gaia. That is mm -hmm. a 3-4 for uh, one and two green, Legendary Elemental with Reach. Um, so that all that's relevant text. And it says, whenever one or more land cards are put into your graveyard from anywhere, you gain two life. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, if there are four or more lands in your graveyard, and you control uh, this and Argoth, uh, you exile them and turn it into uh, Gaia Incarnate. Before we go into that, let's real quick talk about what the land does. The land is a... There we I go. have it. The land is... It's, it's a land. It uh, enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a legendary green creature. And then it taps for green. And then it has an activated ability for two green, green taps. So five total mana. Create a two, two bear, uh, green bear token. Then mill three cards, activate only as a sorcery. Yep. And then uh, Gaia is... Gaia just has every single word on it available that you could possibly yeah. put on it. Yeah, we got... Uh, sorry, Titania, Gaia Incarnate. Uh, Vigilance, Reach, Trample, Haste. Uh, so it'll automatically be able to attack when you when you switch it over, right? Uh, then its power and toughness is equal to the number of lands you control. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, return all lands from graveyards onto the battlefield. From your graveyard from your onto your graveyard, the battlefield. Onto the battlefield, tapped. And then put uh and then you can pay four mana to put a put four plus one plus one counters on a land and it becomes a uh elemental creature with haste as well. So that's that's a lot like that's probably rarely gonna happen, but I think the thing I wanna I wanna scoot all the way back to Titanium Voice of Gaia. Uh a lot of relevant text on this card. The uh three four uh reach obviously blocks Delver quite well. Um if you're playing Wastelands, you're gaining two life every time you Wasteland opponent, not to mention Fetchlands are now gaining you a life. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, th this is another one of those things where like, if Modern Horizons 2 didn't exist, right? Like your 3-4 for, for one green green with Reach that's good against Delver is just Endurance. And it would yeah, it would have been, true. it would have been, like this card would have been really sweet if it wasn't like, if they just, if it wasn't just already pre-power creeped out of the format. like. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's a world where like somebody wants to play this and then they have like their cute fun of in an Argoth in their deck that they can then make a giant yeah. Titania. But like at the same time, like, you know, if you're doing that, you really have to hope that you're putting enough lands into play. So you're one shot killing your opponent off of a big trample haste creature that still gets yeah. swords. Like important to note, Argoth is not a legendary land. So you can, you can it's not a legendary land. You play can have more, more than, than one, one yeah. of them, but it comes you're not to going play to taps, you know so the, the other downside about it is that like this is legendary which also means that if like if you decide to meld it they can just caracas you and like yeah. pick up the yeah. meld creature because there's no there's no like there's it no does not have hex like, proof. there's no hex proof. there's no ward <laughs> yeah. on titania it's just a yeah. big fat green creature and so like the only appealing part of this to me is the three mana three four with reach that like gains you life because that's good against the decks where like those kinds of bodies and relevant life gain is reasonable. And it's whenever a land is put into play from anywhere. So you can like loam off of your, uh, you can dredge off of your life from the loan and gain life if you flip yeah. over a land. And it's like, okay, like all of that is, stuff is cute. And it would have been a card that like had really interesting gameplay, but instead- In they 2015, just printed... this card would have been immediately playable. Dude, before yeah. Modern Horizons 2, this card would have been sweet. Yeah. But they we have Endurance. And yeah. like, this is not going to take the slot of any of the other three drops. And we're, it's we're talking about, but probably not going to see play. All right, let's move on to uh, 
Lauren, where's she at here? Yeah, Lauren's uh, already a, Lauren's guaranteed. Lauren of to, the to third path. Man. Yeah, Lauren of the third path. Uh, this is a two one for two in a uh, two in a white legendary creature, human artificer, vigilance. When it enters the battlefield, destroy up to one target uh, artifact or enchantment, and then tap it. You and the opponent each draw a card. So it's a uh, it's a re- uh, not a reclaimer. Uh, what's it? What's uh, Elvish? Elvish, help me out here. Oh, I know. Yeah, the two the two one elf that ETB is yeah. in, in disenchants. It's a Viridian Corruptor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. So th- this is guaranteed to be a <laughs> one of at least. It's in, yeah, this is guaranteed to be a one of in DNT, and that's not going to be surprising at all. It's got yeah. legendary synergy, so you can pick it up with Kraka, so you can keep disenchanting, similar to how like elves would use uh, the two one in the elf that we can't remember and pick it up with a wirewood symbiote, that's, so that you could keep yeah. doing it. It's it's, it's it, uh, it, Elvish Reckoner, I believe. I I, I might I, I might even still be wrong. But anyhow, uh, yeah, obviously this is this has got legs uh, because you know who wants to put a disenchant in their deck when they can put a creature that's a disenchant in their deck, especially if a, your deck has synergies with creatures. And it's a creature that you can tutor for off of your uh, recruiter because it's a two one. It's got vigilance, which is relevant with equipment. Like if you yeah. do put, it's, a... it's relevant because you might at one point you might be like, well, I'm dead if I don't like get a swords. So I have to draw a card. You know, like so you could attack in and then like tap and be like, well. Oh, I drew the Swords of Oshares, you know, like it sucks that your opponent's drawing a card too, but like, it's not, uh, it's not text that will never see use. No, I think that text is It's just like, it's it's just gravy. It's like extra, like you probably won't use that most of the time, but like it is an option. You can get into positions where it actually is good. So like if the the Vigilance is just strong text, because let's say you equip this with a GTA, being able to attack and block and creature matchups is important. Uh, This is also going to be very good in those kinds of mirrors, but like the... The tap to it, the tap doesn't cost mana. You just tap it, which is yeah. really good. But like the deck already does play for Spirit of the Labyrinth, so there is a world yeah, where you have both exactly. in play, and then you just have a Howling Mine on the table, and they don't. Yeah, and every now one of your opponent's into, turn, you're just tapping this and drawing a card, and they're getting nothing. Yeah, yeah, and then you're put into a position where it's like, all right, well, I have to kill the thing that's letting them go up cards, but they also can protect it with Caracas. But then I also, if I want to draw my cards, I have to get rid of the thing that's also stopping me from drawing cards. And, and they've got you mom, know, you know, like, and there's, there's, it's a lot of tight yeah. space. So I, I actually think that like, if anything, they could have just fucking stopped at vigilance plus being an Elvish, uh, whatever th- that nukes that Elvish disenchant, you know, like the, the, the text, they, they could have just stopped all, on, on all that. But then also this has the potential to just be a howling mine. Or yeah. if you recognize that you're in a very complicated board state anyway, like if you're in a high resource game state, like, if they are restricted on mana, like you can also go up cards if they can't utilize their mana. Like if if you have if you can put this into play and you're taxing their mana via ports, via wastelands, whatever. Exactly. And like like going up cards when they can't actually deploy their shit is also relevant. So like yeah, not to th- mention th- th- you have access to vile. So like you can vile these cards in. You're still like like you gaining you gaining mana. You already have a giant mana advantage because you have vile. So you're going to already be pushing stuff out faster just based on how your deck is built. I think that like, I mean, Lauren in my mind is 100% a slam dunk. It's like, it's definitely going to see it play in DNT. So you will face this card at some point. Like this will be across the table from you in meaningful ways. If you have any reason for them to have a disenchant in their deck, because now they have one that they can tutor for and it will free up a uh, sideboard space for them. But the other part of the uh, thing that I part that I find interesting about this is I think that there's space where this could open up space in uh like i feel like stone blade decks would also be interested in a card like this because if you are in a space where you can have something that can hold your equipment and also free up your sideboard space so you don't need those disenchant effects against a lot of the format which requires that and you're already in if you're already in a caracas build there's like the blue white legends deck that like might be interested in a card like this like all those caracas shenanigans style pick up your deck pick up cards replay them style stuff like lauren is just gonna like Lauren, I think, is like the best card from this set. What well, one thing I think that is important to note, actually, uh, is if, let's say you're playing against Miracles. This, this is someone playing against you, and you ha- you're trying to set up a terminus, and they've got this guy untapped. Like you brainstorm at the end of their turn, you're like, okay, I gotta put. I guess like I gotta put terminus on top, right? Like, and they're like, draw it at the end of your t- at the end of my turn. You know, like what what do you do? Like, do you? Do you put it two cards down and hope that they activate it? Like, there's a lot of shenanigans that can go on with that. I think I think that's an interesting space that this that the, like an interesting interaction that this card has. It's like, 
miracle cards, like even uh, St. Catherine, right? Like, what if I just make you draw that at the end of my turn uh, after you set it up on like a brainstorm or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, like the, the drawing a card aspect is like not naked. Like there is yeah. stuff that you can do. Like, I mean, I don't know, like there's like the fringe, like super fucking fringy stuff. Like, you know, yeah. maybe you mess up a doomsday pile or something like, oh. you know, and catch them with oh. their pants down. Like the, okay. there, there's like, that, that that stuff is very very rarely if ever going to happen but yeah. like the 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 each player drawing a card is definitely relevant text and there are ways to make it so it's it it is um asymmetrical as opposed to symmetrical i mean yeah. this the, but also like this is the type of card where it's like it's good to see that they're going back to symmetrical effects for this type of stuff i get that like it's part of white's identity now that both players get to draw cards but like it, it opens up the space of like what other cards would i want to play to like abuse this effect this work, that, yeah. yeah 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 and so it's like way more interesting so like not only is it an interesting thought experiment but it's also just a slam dunk of a card and it's definitely going to see play awesome all right uh drafna founder of latnam this is a two one another two one for two mana legendary creature human artificer advisor uh it's it's got uh pay one in a blue to return target artifact you control to its owner's hand uh and then it's got three and tap it copy target artifact spell you control so first off i didn't even read the the uh all of the text in my mind of of that it's uh you control to owner's hand so that that doesn't necessarily mean that you uh i take it back it's you control to owner's hand i got i got excited i take oh, it you all back. you could donate shit no. <laughs> yeah no oh. i i was thinking that you could bounce your opponent's stuff for a second i was like i, I read it a, I read it the third nope. time and anyhow yeah uh, i like this card as as maybe uh removing uh if you're playing four emery and four psi in eight cast you could do three and three and throw this guy in and it's just a little bit more value you, you know bouncing a thought monitor to your hand and recasting it getting uh getting uh extra counters off of random uh, off of random artifacts from psi if psi is on the board it's all a little bit win more but all those cards kind of combine together to just create this like avalanche of card advantage that 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 and that's what that deck does is like just ends the game as as fast as possible through incremental value and i think this is a card that could, that could see play in that deck yeah i think that the reason that look I, I the idea of picking up your thought monitor to redeploy it and just having access to do that over and over is pretty interesting but at the same time I don't think it's it, it's not giving the deck access to anything it doesn't already have access to True. and is already very good at doing so the downside is that you have a two one for two in your deck that doesn't do anything unless that's it has not an artifact that's going on yeah it's also yeah. not an artifact right but a and, two one for two can can't attack like you, you know right, Emery I'm, is not I, exactly a beater nor is Psy you know no no well the thing is that both Emery and Psy are giving two, the deck two different axes to fight on, right? Because Psy gives you the access of being able to go wide. Emery gives you uh, a value uh, recursion engine. So like yes. those are two very different axes that can both win the games by themselves and both require specific answers to deal with unless you're actually like removing the creature themselves. Drafna does not give the deck any, like it is not giving it an access to fight on that it doesn't already have access to. This is so it's true. like when... When Kappa Cannoneer came out, Kappa Cannoneer was a, a slam dunk for that deck because yeah. it gave the deck access to something it didn't have before. Psy could go wide, Emery was a recursion engine, and Urza Saga also could go wide similar to how Psy does, where it's like, I'm making a bunch of creatures and I'm going to attack you with them. Emery was like, I'm going to draw a bunch of cards and then we're going to recur stuff. If you are fighting on, if you counter my shit, I'll just rebuy it. And that's similar to the eight cast engine of like, I'm just going to go up raw resources. Emery is, yeah. in the, Emery is in the similar zone of both eight casts and, or both, thought casts and Sai and Urza Saga kind of do a similar space where they're both going wide. Kappa did something entirely different where it was, I can stick this on the table. You're never going to remove it. It goes tall. You can't block it. And it's my TNN and it gets through. So like before you could go wide and you could draw a bunch of cards and uh, play on resources. And then Kappa came in and said, now you can go wide, you can go up resources and you can go tall. Yeah. Where Drafna doesn't do anything of like, doesn't. Well, it can go, it angle. does go wide. But you already are good at going wide. <laughs> for what you know I mean, for what it's worth. Yeah. It's, no, so it's I like, agree. I don't think this is the like th this is the format all star that uh, that uh, that the other cards are. But I do think that this that this could uh, you could see this is a one or two of in that deck, and I wouldn't be that surprised. If if anything, I think that the where this card lives is it it develops a different combo deck where it's one in a blue return target artifact you control to its owner's hand. So if there's any way that you can make three mana one of which is blue off of something that you can then repick back up 
that is a world where you can go infinite because there you are not limited by the number of times that you can pick something up. You are mm -hmm. just limited by how much mana you have. So in my mind, if this card sees play, the game should end because you play this, you combo out like that. I, I don't think of another world where that's like where you could do something like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. The, the, I don't like, know what that is yet. So, uh, it certainly so, isn't like Nyx Lotus or something, but like the, something in that in that mode, something that like taps to produce like like with some work taps to produce more mana than what this is and what it costs. You know. So what's the, what's the card in Bomberman? The four the four drop that picks up the LEDs out of the yard. Uh, that is some kind of ar archivist. Something, yeah, so you, the, 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 the three and a white card out of Bomberman. Our, our Gravian, right? our Gravian something. Whatever it is. Everybody, it's the three and a white one four that picks up artifacts as the combo card out of Bomberman. Yeah. This card, in my mind, is a cheaper Bomberman. Like, I get that Bomberman works with LED because it can pick it up out of the yard. This yeah. one, you have to pick it off up. Well, that's the, table, the thing is, like, we have mana. to find a way to a, a way to maximize what's on the board, right? So that's, I, I think that's the main difference. But you get to play like a mono blue deck in, in that scenario, which means you have access to counter spells. So if, if someone figures this out, it could, it could have legs. I agree. I think the, the only world that I see draft not existing in is part of a combo deck yeah. and you play it plus some other thing, you go infinite similar to Bomberman. All right. So let's talk about soul partition. Uh, one in a white for an instant that says exile target non-land permanent for as long as that card remains exiled, its owner may play it. A spell cast by an opponent this way costs two more to cast. So it doesn't make all of them cost two more, but for now on, this card costs two more to cast. Yeah, if you if you exile something from your opponent's side. It's in white, so it's never going to see play, but it's interesting as like a tricky it's, card that you can it's remove the non something land to get in. permanent right. part to me that is, is interesting. That means that you can get non-creatures. It's basically like, it's obviously not as good as, say, uh, Swords of Plowshares if you're just going after creatures. But as a sort of, uh, okay, like I need to get rid of this this thing. We already have prismatic ending, but if it's something that costs more than that, you know, like it can put, put an opponent back. The pro space I see this in is if like blue white Delver becomes big again, this could be a great tempo card for that. Because then you're like, oh, I'll just daze it now that you had to pay the two extra for it. I mean, two mana for your removal spell in Delver though, like. It's a lot. I mean, you know, it's 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 it, it would it's it's an interesting card. I just don't I don't I don't see a world where anybody's playing this because of the removal that we have access to in Legacy. It's true. I think if you, right. like if you if you if you play this, like maybe there's a world where this can go again. This could go infinite with something because it's exile target non land permanent, but you can play it. Uh, yours costs the same, whereas the opponent costs two more. So if you exile something and then cast it again, and then can soul partition for free or something. And then replay the thing, and maybe maybe there's a loop, but it, you would still cost mana because you'd have to be able to cast the spell out. Of, I, I I don't see you it. lost me it, on so. that, but if if that's the thing that can be done, sure. Uh, I, I just yeah. I, just wanted, I, I don't think I don't think this card's it. Fair enough. Uh, let's go to Hercule, Master Wizard. Uh, it's a two four for two blue and one legendary creature, human wizard, advisor. Uh, and it reads, at the beginning of your end step, if you cast a non-creature spell this turn, reveal the top five cards of your library for each card type among non-creature spells you cast this turn, you may put a card of that type from among the revealed cards into your hand, put the rest on the bottom of your library in random order. I mean, so this, uh, it, this is a super interesting card. Again, like, I don't think this card's going to see play solely for the fact that it is not something that you can go infinite with because it's at yeah. the beginning of your end step, so it's a value card. This is a value down, card, yeah. And the, the, the downside about that type of thing, though, is that at three mana, you're just competing with all the War of the Spark Walkers. It's and true, Uro. it's true. And it's like, um, you're, you're, not going, you're not going to ever beat those cards on rate unless they print something that is, like, so egregiously bad that it warps the format. I mean, the spot that this, that, that, that this excels at is obviously if you're going like Brainstorm, Ponder, Mishra's Bobble, you know, like you're casting like multiple different kinds of draw engine style cards that are like basically like now, now you flip over five cards and maybe you get two cards because you cast some cards. Like, oh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's one of those things like, going for it. this card is excellent. It, it's, it's letting you draw non-creature spells. So let's say you, I mean, the thing is that you play this on three 
And at the beginning of every on step, if you cast it on creature spell, so it's one of those things where you're not getting any value of this if you cast it on, on three, unless you cast yeah. a unless you cast a bobble to follow it up, which yeah. means that you cast a bobble on or your turn if you three, had to follow- protect it with a counter spell, like if you if you like or if you had to catch the force of will, spell, yeah. it's gonna it's gonna count that because it didn't have to be in play when you when you did this. It's asking True. at the end step. True. And then you can pick it back up. The, the the downside is like, okay, you get to look at non-creature spells and then it, whatever you cast, so it's conditional what spells you could find, which means that you could find multiple cards or you could find no cards, no, depending yeah. on what you did. So there's, there's very- Five is deep though. It. Five is a dig, uh, deep dig. Five certainly is deep, but if you want to look at non-creature spells, you could just play a Narset for the same casting cost and then impulse for yeah. non-creatures and find something. And then no next turn, you're going to be able to do that again without having to cast anything. And sure. you could find whatever you need off of that. Like it, it's, it's like, if you just look at what it wants to do, which is value cards, Narset is just head and shoulders above this in like, on like every axis. Something, something like, I want to, I want to point out about this card that, uh, and then we can, and then we can move on is uh, it's asking you to cast multiple different kinds of spells, right. That are non-creature spells and then hit with multiple different kinds of spells, which puts pressure on itself. You know what I'm saying? Like if I cast an instant, a sorcery and an artifact, right. And I try and hit an instant, a sorcery and artifact. It's way less likely that I'm going to hit all three of those. Right. This um, is because again. I, because my whole deck is built with all those cards in it. You know, it's not like there's like instant sorceries or instant artifacts or sorcery artifacts. You know, like with if it was if it was a a creature spell or an artifact spell, like there are artifact creatures that like are combined, right? Like so, there none of those cards combine into like being the same kind of card. Yeah, I think that like again, this is one of those cards where had this been printed before War of the Spark we would all be trying to experiment to make it work because the value yeah. is potentially insane Agreed. and it doesn't get hit by bolt. But like the fact that Narset exists and like probably shouldn't, it's just like this card will never see play because Narset will always take its spot. Yeah. All right. Let's go to Ashnod. Flesh, flesh, m- machinist, machinist, Mach- ma- uh, machinist. Machinist. I, oh, uh, I, I keep. I, I think. I keep thinking machinist. It's 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 mechanist. Yes, it's flesh mechanist. But mechanist. I always think of um. Uh, what's a what's the phrase for um somebody who likes pain? Uh, that is masochist. Masochist. I always yes. I read I I first read this as Ashnod flesh masochist. And yeah, that made it, sense to me, and it made sense. Yeah, that makes and sense. So like I just like you've I, seen I, the I altar. Had, I had to like uh, adjust my eye to see mechanist. Yes, but yes, it's All flesh right, mechanist. So this is a one black mana legendary human artificer that has a one one death touch, and it says. Whenever uh, Ashnod attacks, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, create a tapped Power Stone token. Then you can pay five mana, exile a creature card from your graveyard, and create a 3-3 tapped colorless zombie creature token. So this is a one mana sack outlet when you attack, and then it has death touch, so it can't hold anything on the ground. If uh, blocking on the ground was still relevant in today's legacy, this would have been interesting. Yep. You now, you, the, 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 I think the interesting part about this is that it's just another one mana legendary creature. Well, yeah. Like, the the mox the mox openness of this card uh, is is what's interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like this alongside, uh, like you now have two one mana black legends in the format. You have the vampire out of Strixhaven. That's a one mana black legend that has the similar uh, that has the text. Whenever a creature dies, you exile it instead. And now you have this. So there's like anytime there's like cheap legends, like it's possible that like the legend deck gets closer to being uh, an interesting deck. This one, I think, again, is just like, I think that that the death touch part of this card needed to be relevant. Like yeah. the actual payoff of this card is the being a sack outlet. And yeah. like, that's in, like that, that's I, the powerful part of the card. But like, something to be this, said about the, the fact that, the that, you're making, to be relevant. that you're making power stones. And even though this costs five, if you ever got to that point where you had like three or four power stones in play, like, five mana isn't too much for this ability uh because you have those mana rocks that like you basically can't really use for anything else so i I think it's interesting that they also put the claws of out of your graveyard i think like it's possible that this card like i don't think this is going to see play but i think it would have been interesting if it was a deck that wanted a sack outlet that once you have enough mana you can start eating away at your opponent's graveyard to make yeah three threes like that seems a little bit more interesting to me and it also seems like that would have been a fine thing to do at five mana because like if you're doing that at five mana you are working for it so i i I think that like 
in a world where you want a sack outlet and a one, one death touch on the ground is actually a, a, a reasonable thing to be doing. Like it reminds me back of like when Eldrazi was playable, people would board in their plague engineers, even though it wouldn't be able to hit anything out of Eldrazi except like a mimic, but you would still bring it in. Even if you weren't going to hit your mimics because it could just block their, their thought not seer or block their smasher and trade. And so like a ground round, a, a ground death toucher was just a relevant card in that matchup where you just wanted more density of removal spells against fatties. And it's like, in a world like that, this card is interesting. In a yeah. world where everything flies or everything doesn't need to attack to kill you, like, you know, this is never going to block a Knight of the Reliquary because they can just make a 20-20 instead. Or it's like, if this blocks a Urza Saga construct, whatever, Urza construct, they already made another one and tutored. So it's like, I don't think this is a, a this will see play, but like, it's, it adds to the impending interest of like a Mox Amber yeah. low to the ground. Not, yeah, I, I said or, Mox Oval before. I definitely meant Mox Amber. Yeah. Um, so uh, Perennial Behemoth is the next card I want to talk about. This is a five mana two seven that has Unearth, green, green, and it just reads Crucible of Worlds. Uh, you may play lands from your graveyard. I mean, uh, do you think it's going to outdo the uh, Remnant Excavator? I don't think it's going to outdo Excavator. I think that th this card's just interesting to me because it's a colorless, it, it, like the green is the green green uh, on on this part is relevant, but it's a colorless thing that allows you to do uh, the Excavator thing. But um, we're slowly but surely, like I don't know that it's ever going to be a thing, but we're getting closer to Tron being a deck that might be relevant in Legacy, and this is a great card. Uh, in in those style decks, even in uh, even in uh, what's it called uh, uh, cloud post, where like your opponent killed your cloud post, and you're like, cool, I'll just play this guy, and then I'll get that cloud post back, you know. So I actually think that this card, I don't think it's going to replace Ram and App Excavator because those are often green sun zenith decks. Yeah. So it was probably misleading for me to ask you that question because they're not, I don't think they're competing. Sure. The and same it's space. already asking you to play green, right? It's already asking you to play green. But I think where this would, this card is actually way more interesting is back, like Crucible Bowl of Worlds used to be a card played in lands as uh, another way to protect you, to get lands out of the yard because they would surgical your loams and you wanted essentially a second version of loam that they would use as crucible of worlds to continue getting yards out, lands out of their graveyard. Yeah. So this one alongside loam, you can mill this card and then it becomes a crucible of world for green, green. That's the I thing. That, that's the thing. I, think, I like that. I think, I think that's actually where the space of this card could see play is. I think it's like if that deck wanted access to that kind of effect where they can just stack a bunch of uh exploration effects and then play this out of the yard and then essentially like effectively like pull their into like yog will their yard back onto the board yep. i think is more of the where the power level of this card is and then it just being a 2755 that also is a remnant excavator it's like again i've been playing a lot of triumph of saint catherine four and a white as the floor is like not too difficult in legacy when g games get grindy right and yeah. it's like not it's not unforeseen if you play this with alongside an exploration like this is just a potential turn three play right so it's like the the five mana at colorless in particular is not asking too much for this kind yeah. of effect so i'd like and a two seven is a big body like two seven is pretty large so i mean the fact that no real removal is going to hit this outside of source of plowshares if you unearth it and then pick up a bunch of lands it's probably a two mana draw two to four cards right? If you're playing it in that kind of deck. So I do think that this has space to see play. And it's just a matter of if, a, if builds will adopt, ad, adapt to add it. Yeah. Um, okay. Before, so we've got two cards left. And before we get into those cards, I want to real quick ask everybody, especially if you're listening on the podcast to uh, like, and subscribe. If you, if you listen to the podcast and you don't watch the YouTube video, hook us up, go to YouTube real fast, give us a subscribe, like the video, you know, all that stuff, it really helps us out. It really helps us spread uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Eternal Dirtles doctrine uh, a little bit further. Uh, you know, we can we can evangelize a little bit more to uh, to more people and get them into this great format. Also, uh, I want to quick thank our Patreon supporters uh, at patreon.com slash Eternal Dirtles. Um, all that money goes towards uh, Phil and I creating uh, new covers uh taking time out of our day to make sure that we uh discuss this stuff it just helps it just helps with the uh, the whole thing and bread it, it butters the bread as, as it were um it, so it, it's it, it is very useful to be able to confidently set aside time to edit everything yes. uh you're editing the videos i'm editing the audio like 
it, it is it is so nice to be able to prioritize doing and to just that say stuff. like so look like, i'm being paid for this i need to do it you know that's well, that's, that's the big well, thing that's what I mean. like, like it just it just it, it gives us it, like we already have the motivation we're here almost every week doing these things but on top of that it it lets us set aside time and go hey this is very important i need to do this People are relying on me and we need that. We need to know that you're relying on us to, to get this stuff done. I mean, what I find is, is valuable is that like, if I have, I, I, I can prioritize that. I, I mean, this is just literally how I've been doing it since we, you know, have had uh, supporters support us is it, it's nice to be able to go, oh, I, I, I have the time to do this other thing, this other gig to make more money. I mean, I edit a bunch of podcasts. Like if you listen to uh, Eternal Glory, if you want to listen to Elo Punters, like I edit those podcasts and they pay me to edit those podcasts. And it's it's in that similar space where it's like, I I have the opportunity to make more money editing those things. And I'm sure that you obviously do as well. And being able to say, no, I'm not going to take those other gigs because I have I have the support to be able to, to prioritize doing this yep. podcast, which is the one that I, I, I actively want to do because I enjoy doing it and talking about these cards and communicating with uh, our, our listeners. Like that is a huge reprieve because it just it just makes it easier. It makes to do it, yeah, stuff. it just makes it easier to prioritize and that stuff. Li- and, literally, and- literally the... The the the, pl- the players who have been listening to us for however long it, six, it got to coming up where, on six years, Phil. Coming coming, coming up on six years. six years. But but it's only what it's only our first year where you're editing YouTube video, right? Mm-hmm. But like that's already only... at three hundred. We we just we just cracked a crush three hundred. We want to hit four hundred. I'm gonna do a giveaway at four hundred because uh, it's wild that we're we're doing we're doing as well as we're doing, and so I want to I want to see that continue to happen. Uh, it just it just is. Such a cool thing. Like uh, the goal here is to hit a uh, thousand because once you hit a thousand on YouTube, the YouTube just starts paying you, which is wild. I didn't even know about that. But yeah, uh, it, it, I want to get to four hundred. But like that—that that is an example of like once we had enough. So uh, once we had enough people supporting the podcast, we were like, okay, we can hop into YouTube and actually allocate the time to do it with yeah. all the editing and you know putting the cards up and like having that be. It's like if people don't listen to the podcast, then they can watch it. And it's like, yeah, and it, then that it, was a like, big promise uh, uh, a couple years ago. Is like we're going to start doing video too, and uh, we were able to set aside money and time to like get that training and make that happen. You know? Yeah, so it's like it j- just to like you know I, I know it, there there is the you know um, the general lies. It's like you know if you support us, like it helps us do the thing and like re- replenish all this stuff and like whatever, whatever. And it's just like, that's, th- th- that's where literally where the clear trajectory was. It's like, yeah. we eventually got enough that we could then branch and start doing additional kinds of content or like refine the quality of the content. Like it, it's, it's distinct and that's where it moves. And, you know, as the, the cast in the video uh, or the YouTube channel gets bigger, like we can continue to do more. And then eventually we will get to the space where we are asking for what kind of stuff you would like right yeah. now. It's, it's, it's pretty clear what, you know, the, the, the podcast needs, but anyway, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Exactly. All right. Uh, you have two cards that you wanted to mention before we get into our final two cards. Um, one is Might and Weakstone. The yes. Might and Weakstone is a five mana uh, legendary artifact power stone. When it enters the battlefield, you can either draw two cards or target creature gets negative five, negative five, and it taps for two mana, uh, which can't be spent to play non-artifact spells. So I actually think that this is also a pretty high value target for a Karn wishboard. Uh, I get that five mana is a lot, but if you're in, uh, if you're in Karn decks that are just like you know the Soul Land Karn decks, being able to tutor like this is it's a it, this is a charm, right? This is or, I'm yeah, sorry, it a, is a, command, it is a it is a command, yeah. The, the one, it's like if you tutor for this, it, it by itself is a mana rock, right? Like I get that, like a five mana five mana for you know a mana rock, but like that mana rock also being able to be a divination or a kill spell is pretty sweet. Like let's say your opponent is is got like a, a collector oof or whatever and it's like stopping you from doing your shit it's like being able to tutor i mean Ooh, minus five minus bam. five isn't isn't uh you know minus five minus five kills a lot in the format you know yeah like i get that i get that it's not going to catch our merc tide but like there is a world it where might it, catches, it might though it might but there's that there's a world where it can catch you know night of the reliquaries that aren't large enough there are like the, the just the the fact that this by itself could just be a draw two that also is a mana rock to go bigger is pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, and not to mention like what you're saying about Murktide, like you might have a, uh, a construct in play or something like that. Right. You attack in your opponent's like, I'll block with my seven, seven on your three, three. And then you're like, cool. I'll use Karn to go get Mike, Mike stone, weak stone and weak stone your guy. I, I think that the, the value is like at, baseline it just is always going to be a, a soul ring right yeah. like 
at the, the floor is it's it's soul ring plus divination or soul ring plus doom blade and yeah. i think that both of those as options to condense a sideboard particularly where plus this member are, sir plus this member <laughs> particularly where where karn wish boards are like the space for karn wish boards do get tight you know yeah. and being able to condense any amount of that space this card strikes me as something that uh the ancient tomb decks would like so it, it's similar to the the to the stone brain in my mind it's like it's another tool that so that um ancient tomb decks ha will have access to and i like it's also one of those things where if it's played against me i, it, I, it, I will not be surprised like it, yeah. it totally would make sense to me that this shows up whereas like if ash not showed up i gotta be surprised but like th i think this is a solid deck another solid card for the ancient tomb decks so uh keep an eye on it because it, it being able there are shenanigans that you can do with this card right like it's etb draw two so like if you have flicker shenanigans like that's valuable uh it being a, its own mana rock means that it can ramp up into big shit like ugin or Eldrazi, and it also being able to flicker to kill more stuff is also relevant too so yeah all right and then let's talk card. about uh phyrexian flesh gorger so i actually think phyrexian flesh gorger is the other card that is in my mind feels pretty easy a pretty easy slam dunk to see play it just matters if decks will make room for it i think this is just an, a, a home run for reanimator because you have like let's say you dump this right if you reanimate a seven five menace lifelink that says pay war, uh, with ward pay life equal to phyrexian flesh gorger's power it's like if i play this if you play this add a reanimator and reanimate it now you have a menace a seven five menace lifelinker yeah. and i get that like grizzlebrand is obviously the better card but grizzlebrand is also a seven power lifelinker and that's valuable. not to mention the fact that uh if, if you're in a position where uh you get this into your yard and your opponent exhumes his uh grizzle brand right you put this in it's a seven five menace lifelinker your opponent can't even block with this so he can't really go drawing cards well right? i was going to say that the, the, the and the menace is similar in my mind to flying it's like you have grizzle brand which is a seven uh, seven seven lifelinker that with flying so it's evasive yeah. this is also pretty evasive but yeah. the the upside about this is that it's not necessarily dead as just like a fatty in your hand that you need to discard because it has prototype for one black black to be a three three yep. and so like a three three menace lifelinker with pay ward equal to it, his power so if you that'll try keep and, you in if, the game that'll keep you in the game it, it'll keep you in the game but it's also a thing like i mean i get that source of postures is always just going to be the best removal spell because it exiles but it's like if you play a three three lifelinker with menace and your opponent wants to get rid of it they it's tough for them to be like okay well i can't really fire a bolt at it then take three and then put you in a position to reanimate it out of your yard as right? a seven five. So it's like it's one of those things where it's it's it is good on rate for like the kind of decks that would want it because you have an additional play. But then if it if it dies, fucking great, right? Like that's really what you want. That's anyway. that's where we wanted him anyhow. Yeah. So I actually and, think and that like that's a deck that plays black uh black ritual, dark ritual, dark ritual. Yeah. This, right. You so you could can dark... turn one dark ritual this. You're like I didn't have anything else to do. I'll, I'll dark ritual this. Put into play. And just start swinging, and your opponent's like, "I'll kill it." You're like, "Cool, reanimate." Yeah, and right? I, I, and I and the thing is, like, also it it kills pretty quickly. Like menace is like it is it is not many things are going to be trying to jump in the way of this thing. And if it dies, that's great. And if it doesn't, cool, because if they have to spend any amount of time to interact with you that just gives you more time to find whatever it is. Like if you had to cast this as a three mana three three, you didn't win on turn one, which is what you want to do, but you have if, if they're interacting with you at all they're giving you more draw steps and you're just inherently yeah, the more just, powerful deck so it's like you're gonna you're gonna eventually get to a point where you get out actual grizzle brand at that point you know like if you gain enough life your opponent's gonna struggle to kill you and then and then you're getting drawing more cards you're seeing more cards in your graveyard obviously um so this 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 card i i think though also has space to play in the the value world as well i think that one thing that I have found to be tremendous for me that I wanted forever with Triumph of St. Catherine and Miracles is just having incidental life gain life in your life. deck. Yeah. As, uh, having incidental life gain in your mid-range or control deck. It's like previously you had Oko and now you have Uro. And that's pretty much it. Like the incidental life gain elsewhere, it's like you really had to reach people who go to Wandering Emperor or whatever. But like if you're playing Grixis and you are, you know, trying to play value style, you know, Baleful Strix S Grixis, it's one of the, like being able to have incidental life gain in your deck to be able to give yourself life, life total stability at some point in the game. It's, it's, it's just tremendous against the decks, like particularly Blue Red Delver. So, for example, now that I have Triumph of St. Catherine in my deck, right? 
Anybody who wants to see my deck list can go over to Moxfield. Now that I have that in my deck, it changes the play patterns earlier on in the game that you just didn't have access to before when you needed to consider your life total as a valuable resource because you didn't want to get into positions where they could just bolt your face to end the game. Yeah. So let's say my blue red Delver opponent would open on DRC or open on Delver and then turn two open on the other one, right? So like, let's say they go turn one Delver, flip it, turn two DRC, attack you, and we're off to the races. And now I need to figure out ways to come back. If I had a removal spell, previously I would I would have to point that removal spell at the Delver because it's chunking my life total too hard and I need time to develop so I can actually get back in the game. Yeah. But DRC is the better card. Like I want to go far, after the yeah. DRC. In that position, I want to go after the DRC because the DRC is the better card, but I needed to go after the Delver because it was chunking my life total and I didn't have a way, I needed to protect that because otherwise I would get in positions where even when I do have control of the game, I would just get lava spiked out. Yeah. Whereas now, if I'm in that position, I can get chunked by the Delver three times or whatever to give myself the opportunity to go after the DRC. Because if I flip, when I flip over a triumph and get in, I get to blank all those combats and stabilize my life total. It's yeah. just an access that I otherwise didn't have before in any meaningful playable card. So similar- Saying all that to say this, lifelink is very good and extends the game, especially for decks that so want to do that. Yeah. It's good, it, it, It's good, but it's only good when it's incidental. Like the card has to be good enough on its own. Yeah. But like there's, there's never been a generically only gain life card that's ever been good enough, right? The, I mean, the not, life, not like, in this format, no. Not in this format. Life gain has only ever been good in this format if it happens to just be incidental on another card that's doing something already otherwise powerful. Yeah. So Phyrexian Flesh Gorder, as it's a three mana, three seven, if you are playing, if you build your deck to maximize being able to convert the seven mana seven five version of it, similar to what we were talking about with the blue version of this uh, the, in this cycle uh, as like that Snapcaster Mage card. It's like, if you are doing it where if it dies and then you're doing things to rebuy it out of the yard to as like the big fatty or you're blinking it or doing something in, in that space, that opens up a lot of opportunity for deck building in, in those, for those types of decks, because it's giving them a tool that they didn't have before. It's like the opposite of what we were talking about with draft down, where draft down is not giving a cast anything that it doesn't already have. Whereas Frexian and flesh gorger is giving a bunch of, a couple of different potential decks, something yeah. that it didn't have access to before that is actually really valuable. And then it's just a matter of, is it valuable enough to those decks in current legacy to see play because Frexian and flesh gorger is definitely powerful enough to fill the, to fill that role. Yeah. All right. Well, let okay. So now we can talk about the two the two final cards. To me, these are the two best cards in the set. Uh, Phil thinks that Lauren is. I think Haywire Might might be the best card in the set. Haywire Might is so for for similar reasons that Lauren is playable. Uh, Let's I'll explain Haywire. Haywire. Hey, yeah. yeah. Haywire Might is a one mana artifact for it's a one one artifact creature insect. It says when it dies, you gain two life, and it has green sacrifice it exile target non creature artifact or non creature enchantment. So, first off, let us explain that this card is only good because Urza Saga exists. Yes. That's it. We'll get it out of the way. Urza and Saga well, is busted. It, for, for, for two reasons, actually. Because Urza Saga is an enchantment, right? So if you could target Urza Saga, and Urza Saga can go get it. Yes, yes. It, it, but, the like... Of all of the disenchant style effects that exist, like it's arguable, it would be an interesting to debate in a world without Urza Saga to be like, would this card make it because it says exile, which is important maybe, because that means you maybe. can get, you, th no, it's important because it means you can get rid of shit like Cauldra that other disenchants can't. Sure, of course. So like, but, and th that space is interesting. Also, this is a disenchant that gains life. Like maybe that's relevant. It's also a disenchant that breaks up the mana if you need it to. So rather than paying, uh, uh, is Cauldra itself indestructible? Yes. It, the the card's indestructible. It doesn't just give indestructible. Let's put that the card. Up. The, the card it's Cauldra. Cauldra itself is indestructible. Wow. I I you know I would I would have I would have never known that because I've never tried to remove it. You know. Turns out the the one way that you can get rid of the Phyrexian completed version of the three most legendary and prolific equipment in the history of the game the is a one one insect. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but like. This card is going to 100%. It's going to see play because of the saga exists and you are going to run into it. So like be prepared to play against Haywire Might. Right. Uh, I, I, the two life is relevant, but like not necessary. Um, I yeah, mean, like, no. there, there's not much analysis of, 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 among this card other than that Urza Saga now has a disenchant target. Yeah. And card is this, good. 
this card will just this card is another card that's going to be in a long 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 list of cards as we continue to play where because it is a one mana artifact and urza saga exists assume that this is uncounterable tutorable out of your deck uh that's that's how every one mana artifact is going to have to be viewed for the rest of time so yeah. uh i think i think i personally think that's horseshit but like that's what it is <laughs> and uh hey my white will will be a very good card yeah and i'm trying to find uh there it is Mish mishra's research desk another one mana artifact how about that uh and this one it can be unearthed for one to red and it says tap sacrifice tap one, one tap sacrifice one it. tap yeah yeah one tap sacrifice uh Mishra's research desk, uh, and then uh, you exile the top two cards of your library, choose one of them, and you get to play that one until end of turn. The reason why I like this card is because of cards like Emery, like the unearth is, is extra text, um, but like being able to be like, okay, instead of getting back uh, a, bob a bobble every turn, I'll get this back and get a dig a little bit deeper, right? Yeah, I mean the one day, like this isn't go this isn't an ACAS card because they're playing Force of Wills, but like this is maybe an interesting card for something like Painter, yeah, uh, Red Painter. Like it, it definitely has the space for that. Again, it's a one mana artifact, so Urza Saga can tutor it up. So even as a one of value card to get off the Urza Saga, like it's definitely possible. It's a good card. Like I I, I don't think it would have seen play if Urza Saga didn't exist, but because it yeah. does, it's definitely possible that it could. I mean, we're not talking about every one mana artifact. Yoshin Frontliner isn't making it in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but i'm saying like if you if you wanted that card uncounterable and tutorable out of your deck you could just have it of course yeah and if well, anything it would make your constructs bigger so well yeah uh i think i think that's it we talked about like almost 16 cards maybe maybe slightly more than that um we had even more cards to talk about but like at the end of the day we got to we can't just let me go off about like EDH cards that I really like. So yeah, it, uh, it's and, also interesting. Like there, there is cards like one with the multiverse. You guys can look it up, but it's just a six mana enchantment that is like, okay, well that will never see play because omniscience exists. So it's yeah. just like, there's just like better versions to do with that kind it's, of stuff. It's, so it's like, it's, it's you know. omniscious one card a turn and, and future sight like combined together, which is cool. But like, yeah, like no one's show and telling that into play when they have op the option to play. Yeah, exactly. So instead. it's like, there's a bunch of those cards where yeah. it's like, it's references to like other cards that already exist that are already better. So it's just like, we didn't talk yeah. about them. They're probably great and standard though. Uh, anyhow, th I think that does it for, for us this week. Thanks for hanging out with us. Again, if you get a chance, like, and subscribe. If you want to support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash eternal dirtles. Um, comment on this thing even you know that all that stuff all that interaction helps us um and that's it for this week uh we will see you again next week i suppose coming up